Hi everyone, this is a recording for the Quality Improvement in Population Health Nursing course. Uh, I'm Dr. Emily Tabitzi and I have my colleague Dr. Elizabeth Edmiston. Uh, we're going to be doing the audio recording and we would like to acknowledge our mentor Dr. Mary Delansky who um, will be coming into the classroom to speak more about quality improvement. This is just an overview of what the slides are going to cover. We're going to have an introduction to why quality, a review of the FPV graduate characteristics, a overview of quality improvement, and then we're going to have you do a case study and a worksheet. So just a little bit about Dr. Tavitzi and I. Um, Emily is a postdoctoral fellow at the VA um, in, in Cleveland. She's a VA quality scholar. Um, she focuses her efforts on implementing age-friendly care into the VA. I am just transitioning into the role of chief nurse scientist at the Cleveland VA and formerly was also a VEX um, postdoctoral fellow and I um, did a year of health professions education evaluation and research fellowship. Um, and we both have our PhDs in nursing. This is just a slide to talk about the course description for this class, which includes strategies to assess, plan, implement, and evaluate population-focused programs. So why do we need quality improvement? Um, not only do we want to make sure that we are working within a healthcare system that provides the best, safest, most evidence-based care, but quality is also a part of your core competencies in the nursing profession. The AACN, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, the accrediting body for nursing programs, um, added quality and safety as a mandatory course to be taught within nursing programs as of uh, last year. So as a newly graduated nurse, you'll have to have the ability to integrate these principles of evidence-based practice into your nursing care, work with interprofessional teams, develop leadership skills, and promote a culture of quality. One of our faculty members at the VA is from Texas, and she has a saying that says, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. Because traditionally, physicians, nurses, healthcare providers allow administration or business-minded people to make quality decisions and improvements to the healthcare system, but you are going to be at the front lines, and you are going to be the ones who actually know what the problems are and how you can improve them. And nurses come up with creative and innovative solutions to problems all the time. Um, but these types of solutions are never absorbed by the hospital system at large. Uh, so our faculty tells this to her medical students when they ask why this is important or why we need to learn and do quality improvement. Uh, and it's because you will be at the front line seeing these problems and solutions and we need leaders um, and we want to hear your voice. Uh, so this is just to say that nurses need to be at the table helping make those decisions on what's best for patient safety and improvement. Um, because if you aren't at the table, then someone else is going to be making these decisions for you, and they probably won't be decisions that actual healthcare workers find to be most effective. You're probably familiar with this uh, idea of quality, given you hopefully watch the Institute for Healthcare Improvement IHI videos, but quality improvement was born out of the engineering world and specifically the Toyota Motor Company. It originally was intended to find methods to address performance gaps and decrease waste on the car production line by improving manufacturing problems and technologies universally faced by all management. So this idea and concept uh, was called lean and it evolved and eventually made its way over to healthcare uh, because we want to do the same thing. We want to enhance the value of service by adding products while also eliminating wasteful activities and making sure our customer or patient has the best result, which would be safe, affordable, and available healthcare. In 2007, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement developed the Triple AIM framework. This is a framework that all healthcare should strive to be. Um, again, this isn't a perfect world. The healthcare system improves the health of populations and enhances the experience of care for those individuals through patient satisfaction, all while reducing the cost per capita. Uh, this framework then evolved into the quadruple and then the quintuple framework because um, they realized that the triple aim would never be accomplished in a system that didn't look at how provider burnout and health equity played a role into the larger system. 
So there was some hesitation at first in adding two more aims. Um, many question if the IHI was asking too much of an already overburdened healthcare system, um, but then they realized, um, you know, we can't accomplish these first three aims without addressing inequities and uh, provider burnout. This uh, ideal system of aims is not just a traditional mindset, you know, say you broke your arm and you go to the ER and you get it fixed. This idea of aims relates to the system as a whole. Why did you break your arm, which is the population health idea? The causes don't lie in healthcare. Healthcare is not a repair shop. Um, society also needs us to be um, well and stay healthy while reducing cost because that impacts the larger society as a whole. Um, did you break your arm because you lived in a part of town that had poor infrastructure and cracked sidewalks, or you don't go to a regular primary care doctor because you can't get to the hospital because you have to take two different buses? These are just um, kind of larger system, 30,000 foot view um, that we need to look at healthcare. And we learn that we cannot achieve safety or high quality care without addressing all of these aims. There is a seminal report called Crossing the Quality Chasm, written by the Institute of Medicine back in 2010, that defined quality and laid out these kind of six dimensions of quality needed for healthcare improvement. It's kind of interesting to think that a healthcare system we would um, think would have these dimensions ingrained in our production for centuries. Um, of course, we want to provide the safest care and make sure it's the most timely and make sure it's the most effective. Um, but really, this idea only came to the forefront of healthcare as early as 2010, so only 13 years ago. Um, so the system knows that this is something that we need to work on and we still struggle with, um, but that's why hopefully educating nurses and other healthcare providers can help bridge the gap um, between where we are and where we want to be. Uh, the first three dimensions include that healthcare should be safe, effective, and efficient. Safe being that the care in the healthcare facility should be as safe as it is at home. Um, however, in 2015, it was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine that safety issues were the third leading cause of death and quality gaps. So there's still big holes that need to be filled in healthcare delivery under the safety dimension. Uh, we also want to make sure that care is effective. Um, care should be science and evidence based. We want to have uh, research to support why we are doing something. Uh, we also want to have care that is efficient um, and services that are cost effective. The last three dimensions include that quality should be timely, patient-centered, and equitable. Timeliness meaning no waits or delays should occur in receiving care. Um, we have a lot of DNP students who work on time-related projects like OR time or return to clinic visits once a patient's discharged from inpatient stay. Uh, patient-centered um, in that the system of care revolves around the patient and the family and their needs should be taken into consideration. And that the healthcare system is equitable, that disparities in care should be eradicated, which we know this is a huge issue. There are databases where you can go to look at where care um, inequity is currently um, lacking and we have I can identify that there's huge geographic gaps in this area and uh, continued need for improvement. Uh, as you can imagine, we still have a lot of work to do within all six dimensions uh, to make sure that our healthcare system functions at the top of its abilities. These six dimensions are also uh, referred to as an acronym called STEEP principles. Uh, they're just areas of quality improvement that you want to keep in mind when you come across an error or you're looking to improve upon something within your unit or hospital system. Um, sometimes we get frustrated that these uh, aims or lack of aims in the workplace. You don't have to use all of these principles all the time. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're trying to improve a process um, and taking these into more consideration. Um, is it, are you trying to improve timeliness or are you trying to make something more safe or more efficient um, or any of these other principles? They're just the guiding framework for quality improvement and they're what we strive for. Um, but there are plenty of examples where one or more of these quality domains are not met. Um, but it's our job to identify them and to try to improve um, our system using these principles. 
Uh, take a few minutes to write down some examples to share in class of issues that you may have come across in the hospital where there could be improvements, um, whether that be your own personal or family experience or something you witnessed or heard um, while in clinical. And then um, when Dr. Delansky comes to class, uh, we can kind of have a jam board session and put um, a couple ideas of issues that people have seen or been involved with. And you can kind of get a larger picture of um, some of these issues. A top example of quality improvement and safety that is at the forefront and unfortunately happens a lot more frequently than we hope is deaths or issues from medical mistakes. Uh, it was estimated that at least 210,000 patients die from medical mistakes in U.S. hospitals per year. So this just kind of goes to show that, um, you know, we as a high performing uh, country don't always have the best medical care and uh, still have a lot of improvement to continue to work on. So as a RN, what is your role in quality going to be? Uh, as a new nurse, your role is going to be observing missed care or care that you believe should be happening but is not. Um, you're also going to be observing overuse of treatments that may not be evidence-based. Uh, there's a campaign, for example, called the Choose Wisely campaign by the AARP, um, and they started this program to help decrease excessive testing in the hospital or redundant testing. This campaign had many healthcare professionals contributing for evidence-based practice to what we should not be doing. Um, if you go back to some of those steep principles, you can probably see how a couple of those would fit into this improvement work, um, making the care more patient-centered. Patients don't want to have more tests or have redundant or unnecessary testing. Um, this would also make care more timely because we can get answers to patients quicker about what's wrong with them if we don't keep sending them for um, unnecessary testing. Uh, and this initiative can also make um, it safer because every time you go to have an additional procedure or stick a patient for blood work, you're risking them getting an infection or having a side effect. So by decreasing the additional unnecessary tests, we can hopefully try to prevent um, some of those unnecessary side effects and make the care more safe for patients. Um, and then finally, as a new nurse, you'll be responsible for misuse or errors that you observe or are involved in and then hopefully raise awareness about all of these, which is key to improvement um, and having good leadership skills. So how do nurses learn about quality and safety? Well, before the AACN accrediting body mandated that quality and safety be a core competency in nursing programs, there was an institution from Case Western called QSIN, the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses. Um, but now QSIN has been absorbed by AACN, which is why it is now mandatory uh, to teach quality and safety in nursing programs. Um, but the goal of QSIN is to provide nurses with comprehensive competency-based resources to empower them with the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary to continuously improve the quality and safety of healthcare systems in which they work. And Dr. Mary Delansky, who I believe will be coming in to teach in person in the class, uh, was a leader of the QSIN movement and has had much international success teaching nurses worldwide about quality and safety education so that th they can go back to their academic institutions and hospitals and spread, spread the word. QSIN was started back in 2005. And while Erickson developed the stages of trust, QSIN developed a sense of identity. So the AACN now dictates the curriculum for undergraduate and graduate nursing education and continues to integrate uh, six competencies that nurses should be educated on what patient-centered care is, uh, to learn about teamwork and collaboration, evidence-based practice, quality improvement, safety, and now informatics. So not only do we want nurses to know what QI is, um, but also have the skills to identify the gaps between what best practices and what's actually happening at the bedside and developing small tests of change in QI projects, but then to also have the attitudes to want to change. Uh, attitudes is really the key though, and it's been largely ignored in the past regarding behavior change. So if we think we can contribute to change and we believe then we're more apt to do it. And that is the part of this course where leadership comes into play because you need to be able to raise awareness to help change not only your own attitude towards improvement, but others' attitudes as well. 
And we often struggle with the attitude part. If you've ever been involved in a project or a change idea on the unit or just in your regular life, you can see how it's hard for people to want to change the way that they do things or convince them that something is important. So this is uh, definitely an area that we continue to struggle with in QI, um, but it's probably the most important. QI is not just something for nursing programs. Our medical colleagues are also incorporating this into their curriculum. They've actually been doing this a little bit longer, uh, and nursing has just kind of been getting around to incorporating quality and safety into the curriculum at the accreditation level. Although nurses have been doing quality and safety work in the hospitals, uh, there's been little established in terms of educational guidelines. Um, so this was in response to the CUSE and competencies. This is the uh, medical response in their um, accreditation of uh, competencies as well. So now all healthcare professionals have QI competencies and their own level of trainings. Here is another pause for you to write down some quality improvement projects you may have been involved in uh, during your clinicals, or if you've heard other nurses talking about quality and safety projects that they've been involved in, um, and then if you could bring these examples to class um, for us to discuss. What are some common responses from nursing involved in quality improvement then? Uh, in the first and being the most kind of common is that they complain. Uh, this is common, but mostly when people are asked to do more, they complain. And what they say is that they are overworked or there are too many initiatives or there's no time. Um, as we are evolving in our appreciation and awareness of the need to improve our healthcare system, RNs will hopefully be given more time to do this work. Um, our NP colleagues have already been using this as a negotiating tactic when they go for job interviews, asking how much time they will be given for dedicated QI work, because we all know you can't just throw extra things onto your day um, when you're caring for six patients and um, you only have so much time, you need to have dedicated QI work. Um, and if the hospital system really values the nurses and improving their system, then they'll hopefully come around to allowing healthcare providers to have that dedicated time. And some nurses say, um, why do QI though they don't think it works or it's good? Um, so they won't get involved in QI or they have a negative attitude about it. Uh, we see these um, QI interventions and then the project and initiatives fade away. Uh, this is a big issue within our work um, with change. And then we want our new processes to be sustainable or last long after a champion or a leader of the project is gone. Or maybe they're just not on the unit during the weekends. Uh, we want people to still be able to make changes and continue on with these initiatives even when someone's not looking. Um, but this is an exciting time because we are learning about what it takes to improve the healthcare system and how we can sustain change. And this is um, under a new sector of healthcare called implementation science. Uh, and lastly, lastly, another huge issue with RN's response to QI and gaps in care is that um, we do a lot of workarounds. And we look, we'll look at this later on um, and why this is not always a good strategy. So now we'll talk a little bit about leadership at the front line, which is you. The vision is that every nurse will do their work and improve on their work. And this is um, both at a system level and then also at an individual level. So we're gonna be getting into a little bit of the leadership side of quality and safety. And nurses really make all the difference. Uh, as RNs, we are well positioned to do this work. Um, we often coordinate care with many other interdisciplinary team members. We can spend more time with patients and families about their care and identify some gaps or barriers that might um, come up in conversation. Patients trust nurses and will often disclose new insights that can benefit them um, that they may have never thought to uh, mention in context of their care, but the nurse can pick up on these things and hopefully try to improve their quality or safety of care. So this idea of quality is sort of shifted to this thought process that um, RNs shouldn't just go into work, clock in, do our job, and clock out and go home, and that's it. Uh, but we need to identify problems and gaps in care and then improve upon them. This is already uh, kind of being done during root cause analyses. Um, when something happens, there's a post error huddle that takes place in a team of people who dig down and look at the factors in this process that could have contributed to the error. 
There's also incident reports that are filed when errors happen. Um, these are what we should do in healthcare when errors happen, and most of the time it's done. But as new nurses, you will see that sometimes errors happen and people don't report them for fear of getting in trouble um, by hospital uh, management. This is totally common. Um, but if these incidents are reported, you know, normally a hospital system will help try to protect their providers. Um, there has been some issues where nurse-related incidences um, were taken to criminal trials, but um, you, you know, doing what's right and speaking up about issues that you see or that you've been involved in um, is not only best for, you know, your patient, um, but the hospital system as a whole, because we want to hold people accountable. Um, but this is not to scare you um, that you can never make a mistake. Mistakes are always going to happen. Um, but if we look at why a mistake happens and we try to improve upon the process or the system and we can try to prevent it from happening again. We have a lot of new innovative solutions that come from errors. Um, for example, we have double sign offs from insulin or narcotic drugs, or we have barcode scanners for EHR. Uh, making sure it's the right patient with the right drug, with the right time, right dose, right route. Um, these are all things that have been um, improved on from errors that have happened. And as leaders, we want you to be able to speak up about these um, and do what's right. Uh, we'll have you pause again to think about um, maybe some personal encounters with quality or safety um, that maybe a family or friend has happened. Um, and just kind of think about how these errors may have happened um, now that you're in the clinic doing your clinicals and then maybe how some of these uh, errors can be prevented for future incidences to um, not happen. These are just some examples of some kind of famous errors that have been in the news over the past couple of years and have happened. Uh, one is um, from the Quaid Foundation, which was started by actor Dennis Quaid after medical errors almost um, killed his twin babies uh, after they were given a fatal overdose of heparin. Um, there's the Josie story, which uh, was a toddler who was burned by a faulty temperature system on a water heating heater in a new home. And she was taken to Johns Hopkins, you know, a world renowned hospital and was doing fine and was gonna be discharged home, um, but was given an unfortunate overdose of narcotics and sent into cardiac arrest and passed away. So this just goes to show that some of these incidences can happen at the best hospitals, um, it, you know, with the most unfortunate outcomes. Uh, and finally, there's a example of the um, Emily Jerry incident, uh, a hometown story, as this uh, happened at Rainbow Babies and Children in Cleveland. Uh, where a toddler received a fatal overdose of sodium chloride while getting her last dose of chemo um, after her cancer was um, deemed clear. And it turned out that when the pharmacy board investigators looked into the death and asked the pharmacist how this type of kind of outrageous error would have occurred because it was a known fact that this amount of sodium chloride could result in death, um, the pharmacist said that they were unaware of this fact. So. Um, from this uh, law in Ohio was actually passed called the Emily Law that governs the minimum requirements for an individual to qualify as a pharmacist. And the pharmacist that actually was involved in this case um, was sent to prison but now has been released and works with community colleges in Cleveland to increase IV trainings to techs and to help companies test whether IVs contain the right medication and dosage um, after his kind of experience. So. Uh, these are just a couple examples that, you know, quality has uh, come from uh, improving these sort of unfortunate circumstances. Medication errors are some of the most preventable events that occur. Uh, 1.5 million preventable adverse drug events occur annually in the U.S. And medication errors or high alert meds um, relating to opioids, anticoagulants, insulins, uh, we know these are major players in medication errors. So there's still a lot of work to be done to improve um, in this part of our system. So from medication errors, we have developed many interventions to try to decrease these errors. We have independent double checks, barcode checks, electronic medication administration safeguards and records to help 
uh, unfortunately, many nurse workarounds come from these standard practices to avoid errors. And we do these workarounds to quote unquote, be smart. Um, but in actuality, when we work around the system that's been made to standardize and ensure that we don't make mistakes, this is when we actually do make mistakes. So, so I just gave you a little background on where the need for quality and safety comes from, why we need to see this new way of looking at our careers to help improve the system and not just continue to perpetuate something that's broken, and then a couple examples of quality improvement um, in terms of medication errors. Uh, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Edmiston, now, who's going to talk about what exactly QI is and how you look at a problem through a quality improvement lens and then how you start and carry out a QI project um, so that you can have some experience doing this um, when you go to your floors and when you talk with other nurses who are also going to be doing quality improvement projects or coming across errors or need for improvement on the unit and you can kind of band together um, and use some of these leadership skills that you'll learn to um, improve care. Okay, so with quality and um, QI, there are three dimensions that you need to know about. First, it's a philosophy where people can integrate this into their being and just think about how we can always do things differently, always continuously improve. Um, a philosophy of improvement. And the philosophy of improvement includes um, that we're going to fail, and then we're going to think about how we're going to do it differently next time, just like you do in your personal life. Um, this philosophy of improvement includes that we have to be transparent with learning and that learning is painful and we have to be okay with that and we have to be okay with failing. The second dimension is that quality improvement is a problem solving tool. It involves all of these management tools that help us understand exactly what the problem is. Um, these tools that we have help us understand the problem. And then thirdly, um, QI, the third dimension is that um, it's an application of theory-driven science of system of change. So it is a science. Um, it has its own statistics, its own theories and frameworks. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So what exactly is quality improvement? So like I said, it's a systematic data-driven activity. Uh, you have to collect data and you can't just assume what you're doing is making an improvement or not. Um, QI is also designed to bring immediate improvement, which is very different from research. In QI, we're doing things locally to within a certain context of a certain unit or clinic um, to get immediate improvement. We're not putting in research protocols to discover new knowledge. Um, it's very different. Research is made or is designed to um, disseminate information to a general population. We are making local change here in QI. Okay, um, so local. And then it's, um, again, the philosophy, the tools, and then tools of science. So keep in mind those three dimensions. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the history of um, quality improvement. So everyone knows flow. Florence Nightingale was a pioneer of quality improvement. Um, she was an English statistician, and then she worked in the Crimean War as a nurse, as we know, from 1853 to 1856. Um, she created one of the first versions of the pie chart called a rose diagram, which um, showed the causes of mortality, basically of unnecessary deaths during the war as a result of preventable infections. That's when she decided to map out the units she opened windows and improved unit cleanliness to help reduce some of these unnecessary deaths. Um, this is very impressive for nursing because Florence Nightingale is seen as the originator of quality improvement. She has many accolades for her statistics and her um, what are called the polar area diagrams, which documented the data to understand the system of care in which the soldiers in the Crimean War were dying under, you know, not just out in the fields, but in um, where they were getting medical treatment. So what she unraveled in her statistics and improvement work was that the environment was causing these infections that were leading to their mortality. 
It wasn't gunshot wounds or wounds from the war itself, but secondary infections. So, as we know, this is common in hospital systems still. This drives home to all of you the importance of data, especially now that we have our excellent EMRs where obtaining data can be rather easy um, and so that we need to use those to um, move our work forward. Another uh, famous quality improvement pioneer was Dr. Ernest Armory Codman. He was a surgeon in Boston in the early 1900s. Um, notably, Dr. Codman in medicine, um, you may have seen the Codman Award being given to many of the hospitals here in Cleveland um, and around the country, but Dr. Codman uh, led the philosophy and skill of looking at his work, and he stated in his um, journals, I had made an error of skill or the most gross character and even during the operation failed to recognize that I had made it. So he had this reflective capacity to look at his work, look at the system in which he was working, and then make improvement in it. Moving on to theory, this is really important. I know theory is not everyone's favorite subject. However, um, the theory of profound knowledge has four dimensions that we're going to talk about and these are very important uh, when you're designing your quality improvement project or any project you need to make sure you have all four of these um, uh, aspects to make sure your project is rigorous and thorough so we're going to talk through um, knowledge of a system knowledge of variation knowledge of psychology and theory of knowledge this theory um, is called the theory of profound knowledge and it is embraced by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, which I think you have all done the modules. Um, and so this is supported by um, large QI in, um, institutions and it's seen as um, the sort of, uh, you know, the theory, the go-to theory in QI. So the first aspect of the theory of profound knowledge is knowledge of a system. Knowledge of a system is a key concept, and um, as Emily has gone over the importance of systems thinking, um, we know that knowledge of a system can be better appreciated through the tools of improvement. So one tool that we often use is a fishbone diagram. Um, it's also called an Ishikawa diagram or cause and effect diagram. Um, you can see that the square at the right um, basically the fish's head says wrong dose medication um, so that would be your problem then all the bones are the reasons of why that quality gap exists or the barriers to quality so what you do is you fill in the areas or the bones of the diagram by gathering data so maybe you interviewed people or leaders on the unit or you're asking staff or leaders what their perception of the quality gap is Maybe you observed on the unit what you can see is occurring, or you just follow the process. Um, once you collect all of this baseline data, you can put the data into categories. Um, there's lots of different formats for the categories, but you can um, use the categories that you see that fit your data. Um, you can see here that the gap for the wrong dose of medication is being, that medication that's being delivered is that there are human errors that may have contributed also individual attention errors maybe errors in knowledge so when you use this tool to understand the system it helps you categorize and narrow down possible areas in where you'd like to start your improvement efforts the second aspect of the theory of profound knowledge is knowledge of variation um, this is all about data we have to collect data. It's a key tenant of this theory. So our tool that we use in the knowledge of variation is called a run chart or a sometimes people use a little bit of a more um, rigorous statistical chart called a statistical control chart. Um, you can see here that this is a basic run chart where the x-axis axis is time and the y-axis is the number of events which would be infection. So at the start of October 20, 2000, sorry, 2002, there were about 24 infections in this ICU, and they wanted to improve by decreasing the number of infections. 
So the power of the run chart is that you can identify or explain the interventions by placing them on the run chart, so it's annotated. And then you monitor the effect of the intervention. As you can see here, the first intervention they tried is um, by decreasing, I'm sorry, to decrease the number of infections um, was multidisciplinary rounds. And it did have a small effect. Then they instituted a standardized hand hygiene protocol. You can see that had a huge impact from 19 infections down to about three, which became um, a key component of the work. Next, they instituted a ventilator bundle, but unfortunately, you can see after they did this, they had, um, there was an uptick of infection rates, and when the observation was made as to why they realized they had lost their manager and ICU director. So once they got the ICU director back in place, their infection rates dropped again. Then they instituted UTI bundles and central line bundles and continued to sustain a reduction in infections. So the power of the knowledge variation is key here to understanding our impact on our quality outcomes. And run charts are very helpful when you are trying to show um, leadership and stakeholders and um, even your staff um, say, look, we have been looking at the data and our improvement efforts are really coming to fruition and we are um, making improvements in our local context. The third component of the theory of profound knowledge is knowledge of psychology. So how do we get people to change? Um, this is also where implementation science comes into play, which I'm sure you'll hear um, here and there throughout your quality improvement classes. Because in implementation science, we're learning about the, ha the change behavior of our healthcare professionals. So there are a lot of different strategies that we can use um, in psychology to get people to uptake or adhere to evidence-based practices and even adhere to um, things like hand hygiene protocols. It's this knowledge of psychology that's key. So as you can see here, one example of this concept is called the Rogers Adoption Innovation Curve. What they learned in their work for why people change or who changes is that there are innovators who are people that change right away, they're gung-ho, um, they, they are usually our project champions. Um, and then that, there are also these laggards. 16% of the population will never change. So you either have to get them off your unit or you have to institute some kind of protocols that requires them to uptake interventions. Um, and there are a lot of different strategies that you can use um, to help people change. The last concept in the theory of profound knowledge is the theory of knowledge, which is where we figure out how exactly do we generate new knowledge? How do we test interventions at the local level to learn or and use or keep what is useful and get rid of what's not? This is the model for improvement, which you're learning about in IHI's open school modules. The three key questions are, what are you trying to accomplish? How will we know if a change is an improvement? Um, which means that you're collecting data and measuring something. And lastly, what changes can we make that will, res that will result in improvement? And then you test those changes using your PDSA cycle, Plan, Do, Study, Act, as you see here. So in the PDSA step that you're running, you're running many of them in order to see what exactly works. Which one leads to changes that result in the improvement of our care delivery? So it does take many different kinds of interventions to get an improvement. A lot of times we start with education first and then maybe we move to checklists. And then you'll see you might need a third or fourth to really see some improvement. And this diagram shows you a really neat and clean way of that PDSAs are running um, on this slope that results in change improvement. Whereas in the next slide we'll see that it's not usually that clean. This is probably what actually your PDSA um, cycles will look like. Um, why is improvement so hard? Well, you don't see a nice straight line uh, like the previous slide it actually looks more like this. Healthcare is very complex and very nonlinear. Um, and in QI and in implementation science, in our research, we're studying complexity science and um, try to under trying to understand how complexity really works. You can see here, it's kind of just a funny slide, but there are barriers, 
Um, the line is a squiggle line because as we know, our improvement efforts don't always help. Um, or as you could see in the run chart, when we lost a key leadership um, or a key leader like the ICU director, that our improvement efforts were sort of staunch. Um, there are challenges, there are opportunities, and some of the PDSA cycles don't even fully go around. So um, just know that you know, there's a lot of diversity to your PDSA cycles and um, you just have to decide if um, they're working if you need to change them a little bit and then rerun them, or if you just completely abandon them, and that's okay. So while there may be many barriers to QI, um, there are factors that help facilitate, facilitate your project, such as interprofessional collaboration. So if you're doing a project on your unit, make sure you get um, not just nursing support and um, team members, but also other professions. Speaking of teamwork, teamwork is a facilitator. So if you have good teamwork, you're going to have a great project, regardless of the success. Um, it's helpful to incorporate people from an informatics department if you have one. So potentially maybe you would want to change something in an EMR. Um, then you can um, help informatics people um, can help you do that. Data analytics are also very helpful. Um, they um, will help you pull data. They can also help you get um, things into an Excel spreadsheet for you to use easily to make your run chart. Um, and they can help define your project as well. And then just effective management. Um, this is talking about effective time management and team management. Make sure if you're going to have a meeting that there is a purpose for your meeting. Create an agenda. Um, stick to the time that you all agreed on um, and then potentially you would um, you know change those meetings uh, meeting frequency as needed okay so now we've finished the theory behind quality improvement and we're gonna move on to application so how exactly are you going to do your quality improvement project and so we're gonna go through the steps here using the improvement project worksheet and then you will then do this in class with a case study with Dr. Delansky. So Dr. Delansky has been doing quality improvement for over 20 years. Um, she's developed this worksheet to help take these concepts of improvement and then put them into some steps so that we can better appreciate what it takes to make the improvements. In this worksheet on the first side there are three steps that really need to get done before you, um, even before you think about systematically what you are going to do. There's a lot of data collection and understanding and observing um, that need to occur as systems thinkers and as systems observers to actually perform before you do any PDSA cycles or tests of change. In this improvement worksheet, you first have to identify the goal. What's your global aim and who are your team members? Then you want to get some data about what actually the problem is to better understand the problem. I think many times we jump to thinking we know what the problem is without asking other people what the problem is. Then I think the next thing is to collect some data or evidence to find out what we know in the literature about the problem and what other people have tried about the problem. Um, the two methods here in step two are looking at the literature the evidence and secondly go do an industry assessment what are other hospitals doing are there benchmarks or other standards of care that you don't know about what are some of our professional organizations doing or saying we should be doing what are things posted on the IHI website as helpful ways to approach this problem then the third step in this QI process is to identify the systems issues this includes looking at the context and maybe assessing organizational readiness for change. Are your stakeholders engaged in this process improvement? How can you get them engaged? Is there evidence of any teamwork? Are there any data available about the problem you're observing and want to address? The tool to use for looking at the system is a process diagram, which is a QI tool where you observe someone doing the process about the problem you are looking at and then you map it out. Um, just like the girl in the picture. Then you would also complete a fishbone diagram after you've interviewed people and observed 
Uh, fill out those barriers to help you understand the root cause of some of the issues that are leading to the issue at hand. Some categories you can add to your fishbone are things like people, process, equipment, materials, environment, and management. Um, and that's the first side of the worksheet. We really want to focus in on it because a lot of people skip these preliminary steps and then they move right into trying to fix the problem. Then the second side of the worksheet is really where we start um, making moves toward change. You will take your baseline data and come up with a specific aim. Um, a specific aim is what exactly are we trying to improve? You want to make sure it's a smart aim, so make it specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. In your aim, you want to make sure that you're saying you're going to increase or decrease whatever area you're trying to improve, and um, by how much. So if you're baseline problem started at 55%, maybe your goal is only to get it to 60% because that's the benchmark or um, the industry standard. Maybe you think you can make a larger change, but we don't want to bite off too much right away. So don't go from zero to 100. Um, the other thing to remember is to have a reasonable timeline. So say by what date are you going to have this achieved and make sure that you give yourself um, a reasonable date. Then you're going to talk about measures. How do we know a change is an improvement? You want to make sure that you are measuring the outcome, um, which would be the the uh, related to your specific aim, but then also you're going to measure things in the process. So are parts of the system performing as planned? And then, um, and we're going to talk about these in a minute um, in more depth. And balancing measures are things that, um, as you improve one process, are you causing um, new problems in other parts of the process? Um, step six is to identify and choose change ideas. So what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? So this would be where you um, can brainstorm potential PDSA cycles or interventions. You can also use something called an impact effort matrix, which is helpful to say, um, you know, how difficult or how much effort would you put into doing that intervention and how much impact would that have? So you can sort of rate them on this um, scale. I will show you this also later. Um, and then, you know, pick the things that are the least amount of effort and have the most amount of impact. Um, first because that that will make dramatic changes to your system and then finally step seven is to actually do the pilot test of change or the PDSA cycle so um, you have to plan it so how will the idea be tested do it so that's when you implement the intervention um, and that includes your um, measuring your um, outcome measures your process measures and your balancing measures and then you analyze the data. You want to continuously analyze your data or at certain time points to make sure that um, you're actually having some improvement. So if you're not, you can adjust um, your plan. And then act. What should be done to change um, to the change idea? So are you going to keep it, abandon it, or adopt it? We're going to go through each of these steps and talk about an example from Dr. Delansky's previous work in um, improving cardiac rehab attendance. Um, so right here you can see on the improvement project worksheet, um, side one or side A, that you will put a project title and then you just want to identify your team members and again make sure that you would include um, interprofessional team members as well and also know that Team members can be different than stakeholders. So who do you need on your team? Don't have too large of a team or too small of a team because those are barriers to teamwork. But also if some, if you just need someone's support, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be on the team. And then also consider um, having some patient on or patients on your team as team members because they have a really valuable way of being immersed in the system as um but in a different way than we are immersed in the system, so their input can be um, very fruitful. Um, this just goes over specifically about the um, preliminary step. Also make sure that you 
in your project, identify which quality domains you um, you are addressing. So remember those steep principles: safely, timely, effective, equity, efficient, and patient-centered care. So you can um, sort of just keep those in mind, and when you go to sell, you know, sell your project to your stakeholders that you're doing this, that you can um, reference these steep principles or a few of them to say that you know we really need to make sure that our care is effective and efficient um, in, in these ways according to our project. Um, and then the example title is to increase cardiac rehab participation rates and we're going to go through each of these steps now. So the first step is step one, not the preliminary step, but step one is problem identification where we are going to list the problem and list the general overall aim. This is just a, a global aim, a world view um, not a smart name, so um, just in general. So in this step one, think about, well, we have the quadruple aim here, but remember that Dr. Tavitzi said it's actually a quintuple aim now, um, adding equity to um, these, these five aims. What is the problem? What frustrates you? Um, you're going to collect some data on the problem, um, or maybe your leadership came to you and said, you know, we have this problem here. We're supposed to be doing this on every patient, and right now only about 50% of the nurses are doing it, or say, like, I think we are doing it, but maybe maybe it's just not being documented or not documented in the right place. So what exactly, um, not what exactly is going on, but generally what's going on. And then for our example um, of cardiac rehab, the global aim is really just to improve cardiac rehab participation rate. So like I said, it's that global view of uh, your project. In this step one, you are going to start collecting data. Um, as we know through projects in, in research and in quality improvement, you're basically continuously learning about the problem and the system and the solution. So you're going to start surveying, interviewing. Maybe you feel like doing focus groups. You can do a focus group with your unit or focus group with patients or focus group with leadership. Like just think about the information you're trying to gain and you want to shed light on all the perspectives. So find out about um, everybody's process. So maybe um, even within um, your nursing aides, the process for each of them is different. Maybe one of them has a workaround, um, but you want to get these perspectives from every um, aspect of the process. So then you move to step two. Step two is current evidence. So you're going to look at the literature. You're going to look at evidence from industry. Um, industry could be, uh, if you're doing a project on a specific brand of equipment you can look at that company um, a lot of times those companies have run trials on their um, you know their equipment other hospitals what are they doing uh, call call someone look up somebody and email them um, and people are happy to share and then um, if there are benchmarking um, or benchmarks or getting any sort of benchmark data if there are some on your um, project So in our cardiac rehab example, you can see this is the description of the problem. Um, they had data saying that, you know, so for every 100 patients with a qualifying um, diagnosis for cardiac rehab, 64 were hospitalized, 36 patients went to clinic, and so on and so forth. And then um, by the end of it, only 30 patients of those 100 had completed cardiac rehab, which gave cardiac rehab less than a 30% essentially eligible patients even go to cardiac rehab. So the completion rate was, um, even the completion rate was 75%, but then people weren't even going. Um, so it was a huge problem. Then as step two says, collecting current evidence in the literature, there was a meta-analysis. Um, those are the best things. Those are the ones where they take multiple research studies and then combine them into one um, giant meta-analysis. Um, and then any randomized control trials, especially if you can find um, an RCT that was done some on some similar population or context to what you're looking at, those are very helpful. Um, industry, what are other cardiac rehab problems doing? So um, a lot of places um, 
you know, put on their websites exactly what about their programs. So you may find some information um, throughout, you know, other health systems. And then what does the IHI website say? What does American Heart Association say? These are places that you can find really good information on current evidence. Okay, so step three, um, you're studying the system. Identification of current process or of system performance. So then we're going to go through right now um, ways to do this um, in uh, process diagram or fishbone. Um, and then there are other tools that you can also use that might be more relevant for your project. As we've mentioned, um, here's the fishbone diagram. So for cardiac rehab example, low participation would have been the head. Um, and then you can change where it says people process equipment. Um, you can change these categories to make them, if those are not relevant for your project, but something else might be. You also don't need all six. Um, if you don't have the barriers that fit in some of them, just get rid of, um, you know, one of the fish bones. And then um, for the cardiac rehab example, instead of a they did a process diagram, but this one, as you can see, is called a swim lane, um, where you take each of the different um, maybe professions or people that are involved in the process, and you can see, you can follow the process and the person doing it. So this is helpful in some projects. Um, I, for my projects um, at the VA, have never found that to be specifically helpful because the process was um, sometimes just limited to a certain profession or a provider. Um, so it just depends on your project. And um, as you can see here, the beginning of the flow diagram, which you're going to do on yours, but you're going to just do it as an overall flow diagram, started with hospital discharge and ended with cardiac rehab um, at the end of cardiac rehab. So they wanted to see that people were completing it. So that was part of their process as well. During this, um, to understand your system, you need to do a stakeholder analysis. So this includes who needs to be involved. Like I said earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, they need to be on your team, but you do need to maybe get their, um, their approval or blessing. Um, who are the actual stakeholders? Make sure you include patients. Patients are your stakeholders. Your unit or your area, those are your stakeholders. Um, and then in the end, who is going to deliver this change? So um, you need to involve your stakeholders early and um, figure out how to get them invested um, so that they support your project. To further your understanding of your system, you may need to um, find out about the people and the management. So what is the staff knowledge on the process? What's their attitude toward the process? Um, what kind of workload does this process create and are there workarounds? Um, do the staff have the skill even to do this process or um, maybe they aren't even trained? Um, and then also what's your patient's knowledge and attitude toward this process? Is this helpful for them? Um, Management. You want to talk about leadership support. Um, find out what resources you have. Do you do you have the equipment that you even need to you know make improvements or the time? That's a huge thing that people talk about is that they don't have administrative time to sit down and really work on these things. You shouldn't expect your team to really like put um, a lot of effort into the actual part of the project besides doing maybe the interventions while they're on the clock for um, taking care of patients. Um, and then what's the leadership attitude and the unit and floor or floor culture? Um, so are they accepting of change? Are they supportive of your project? Um, and how do you get them? Um, how do you get them to support you? Continuing to understand your system, you also need to understand your process. So for our example, what did what do staff tell patients about participation? What happens if the patients are a no show? And do patients have a plan if they can't attend? Um, like, is there a makeup session? So these are things that you need to find out about your own process. So some examples from the cardiac rehab um, example of the data they collected, they found out from leadership that they were not willing to increase staffing. So that would have been, um, you know, that is a could be a large barrier for your project. Um, you have to get more creative with your solutions. The staff were not aware of the low participation rate. So 
people really love data and they love seeing um, how their impact, how they personally are impacting the system. So something to consider when you're doing a project is to make sure that you um, continually update staff on the data. Uh, patients um, said they were frustrated as when they came in, um, they had to wait before starting. So prior to class, um, talking with staff. And then patients didn't understand the importance of attendance, and they also didn't feel welcome. So these were um, some problems that they found um, that people were not coming to cardiac rehab. So again, a fishbone or a cause and effect diagram. Um, this we talked about this a little bit, so you would fill in those barriers that you have collected from your data um, and put this on your cause and effect, and you're going to practice that in a little bit here. Moving on to side B or side 2 of the improvement project worksheet, the first step on this side, step 4, is to make a specific game. Here's a template of a specific game. Again, it should be clear, focused, specific, and linked to a time frame. So by a certain date, you're going to increase or decrease what you will be changing or your metric. Um, in what population or what unit, um, however you're defining your problem. And then by um, a certain percentage for the increase and decrease. And then make sure you add a date. Just to drive the point home. Here is an example um, from the cardiac rehab example. So by December 2020, you would like to increase participation in all cardiac rehab patients by 10%. Um, and so uh, this is just an easy way you can fill in your own project information um, to make a smarting. Moving on to step five, these are your measures. Um, you learned in your IHI modules that there are the th these three types of measures, outcomes, process, and balancing. So how are you going to evaluate each of, these, um, each of these things? So for the type of um, measure, so you have your outcome measure, which is your main problem, or in cardiac rehab example, the participation rate. A process measure is related to a change strategy. So in the process, for the process measure of cardiac rehab, they wanted to make sure they were measuring the referral rate as well. And then your balancing measure is a consequence of change. So they wanted to see that if they um, increased cardiac rehab participation, were they also increasing patient satisfaction or potentially decreasing patient satisfaction? Um, the other example I like to give of a balancing measure is um, uh, how if you are, say, say you're on a unit and you're trying to reduce UTIs from catheters after surgery, and we know the evidence says to take catheters out after one day, then the balancing measure might be to measure the amount of falls on the unit. So if patients um, have to get up to go to the bathroom, they may fall more often. Or there could be more skin injuries because of bed incontinence. So, um, you know, think of other things that your intervention might be impacting. Um, so even if the outcome of your intervention is positive, you could be causing something else to become negative. Or um, could be a, a positive side effect like increasing patient satisfaction. Um, so it's just any sort of consequence of the change that's occurring. Step six um, is to identify and choose potential change ideas. Um, so you want to choose um, some processes to get better results. And we're going to talk about brainstorming on the next slide. So while you're brainstorming, some people like to just immediately put um, each idea into an impact effort matrix or potentially you make you brainstorm, you make a list of ideas, and then you take all those ideas and put them on an impact effort matrix. These are, this is very helpful. You can see the further um, you go to um, the right is more effort, and then the higher up you go is more impact. So the things that you want to hit first are the low effort, high impact. So these are sort of the low-hanging fruit things that you can do. You can check off your list um, that do have a lot of impact. Um, but then maybe if you have a lot of resources, you're able to do um, a high effort that also has a high impact. So you want to make sure that you're just not doing the low effort 
or the, I'm sorry, the high effort, low impact items because it's not going to help your process change and it's going to take a lot of work. Then you move on to finally step seven. So this is where we're going to talk about um, pilot testing your change ideas and how do you run a PDSA cycle. For our cardiac rehab example, that team decided for their change interventions in March 2019 that they would make a policy change. Um, in October 2019, they made a seven-minute welcoming video. Remember, the patients said they didn't feel welcome. So this welcome welcoming video was shown to patients as they started cardiac rehab. It's still shown today. Um, it also won a sil silver reel award for excellence in patient communication. And then in July 2019, they started a motivational program. Now, the motivational program you can see is not just for um, rewarding patients that staff members were also rewarded after one to three months of effort. So it is very helpful to reward people for small wins, but also rewarding for effort. So make sure that you know your staff knows that um, you appreciate what they're doing and their hard work and that their work does pay off because um, people do care about improving the process. So throughout their um, PDSA cycles, they did have some challenges. Um, the classes were not ending on time. So they decided to start alerting the patients of the need to end on time and then scheduled, they scheduled a time for questions at the end of the day for um, patients to um, ask staff questions. And then they also found a challenge that staff were not aware of participation rate. So a lot of times you'll find that the people doing the work are not aware of the data, like we've been talking about. So they decided to post a weekly dashboard of the participation rate and then other information to give to staff. Um, again, to firstly to inform the staff because the staff do care about these things, but also because we want the staff um, aware and we want them to remember and um, see the project, you know, at all times. Like we want it to be in the forefront of their mind. That, that we are trying to improve these processes for our patients. So going back to that um, PDSA cycle picture, um, you can see that for cardiac rehab, they did use the theory of profound knowledge. Um, it impacted every aspect of the QI project. Um, they needed knowledge of a system. They collected data. They used run charts. And um, they understood the stakeholders and the changes. And then they gained new knowledge to affect the system to change. And all of these interventions did result in improvement. You can see here on their run chart um, that they annotated it. There was a baseline period. And then um, each PDSA cycle was um, spaced out um, for different periods. Um, and the line going through the middle is showing the improvement. And it was statistically significant and clinically significant as they got a lot more patients um, through cardiac rehab per month. Okay, so um, this is the point in class where um, you will break out into groups to complete a case scenario um, of a quality improvement project given to you. Um, I believe it should have been posted to the Canvas site for you to review ahead of time if you um, wanted to do so. And you will use this pro improvement project worksheet. Dr. Delancey will complete this slide presentation and then coach you through the activity. And we hope all best of luck in all your future improvement projects and never hesitate to reach out to us or Dr. Delansky um, just for any quality improvement um, information you want.